Hello everyone, today we're going to explore Seasonship Education which is part of your chapter 3 and we're going to explore the role of government in Singapore. This is Mr. Go and good day to you. So in issue 1, we are actually looking at 3 chapters. So it's chapter 1, 2 and 3. We are looking at how can we work for the good of Singapore. In the first part, we'll be exploring about how the government can actually help Singapore and what should the role be. So that will be the role of Singapore and the next part is the role of seasons in society because government does not make up the society, it is part of society and seasons do have a part to play as well. Let's take a look. So for the roles of government, there are actually four kinds to take note of. One is to maintain internal order and external security. Next, to ensure justice, provide goods and services for the public and last but not least to safeguard the interests of the seasons. Okay, so for the first part, we'll be taking notes of the maintaining of internal order and external security. This is part of the benefits you get as a season as well. So what does the word security mean to you? Let's take a moment to think about it. So security actually refers to two aspects. We have talked about internal security and the other aspect is external security. When internal security, we are talking about internal order, such as your police, prison, civil defense. They are supposed to protect citizens and their property. For example, if you are robbed, you expect the police to be able to ensure that you are safe and not killed and your properties will hopefully be recovered and people do not go around stealing your properties. Next, we also talk about social services such as schools and hospitals to ensure there are peace and safety for the seasons. So this is actually important. For external security, so we are looking at the Singapore Armed Forces. They ensure that Singapore is safe from external attack. We have a number of agencies. In this case, we are talking about Army, Navy, Air Forces. And not just that, we need to strengthen it and make sure that Potential enemies are deterred from attacking Singapore. So before they actually attack Singapore, they are stopped before they actually attack. So the damage is non-existent or reduced to a minimum. Okay, when we talk about internal security, these are the agencies that we're talking about. We have casino regulatory authorities. Well, they regulate their casinos. Uh, and we have Central Narcotic Bureau, which is to deal with drugs and make sure that Singapore is safe from drugs. You have Home Team Academy to train future well, policemen. Immigration and Checkpoint Authority are very important. They make sure that the people that are not supposed to be in Singapore stays out of Singapore. And make sure that illegal substances uh, do not enter Singapore as well. Internal Security Department to ensure uh, potential terrorists or terrorists or threats to Singapore are actually contained before they are much of a threat. You have Singapore Civil Defense, you are talking about, well, to make sure that people are safe, such as in a fire or like in a terrorist attack. You have Singapore Police Force, I think you know why it is, to make sure that the population is safe and adhere to the law. And Singapore Cooperative for Rehabilitative Enterprise. This part is not usually commonly known. It's to actually ensure that prisoners who are ex-convicts, that when they come out, they actually will be able to rehabilitate into the society again. And Singapore Prison Service to ensure that our prisoners stay inside prison. Okay, for external security, we are talking about uh, the main three forces. We are talking about Singapore Army, which is the land force. We have the Republic of Singapore Navy taking care of the sea and we have the Republic of Singapore Air Force taking care of the air. We will look at the all D to 73 of the course book. We are actually discussing about the roles of the various government agencies because some of you may not even know about it. It's important to find out more about it so that you have actually know what they stand for and how they actually contribute to the safety of Singapore and what contributions they have done and these are information that you have done in the worksheets. Okay, besides that, um, there's a number of things to take note as well. We are talking about the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, they actually exist to maintain Singapore external security as well through diplomacy. Diplomacy is the act of uh, making friends with other countries. So when you're making friends with other countries, they are your friends. They will not attack you if they are friends. So it's actually uh, advancing mutual interests and mutual benefits as well. So what is diplomacy? Diplomacy is the work of maintaining good relationship between governments of different countries. And so in between friends, we have to maintain good relationship so that your friends will stay as friends and not enemies. 
it's the same for countries as well. Think of that. Besides human interest, we are talking about country interest as well. So we need to maintain good relationship to advance both interests through diplomacy. Example, Singapore actually played a key role in the negotiation of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. It's actually important during the 1970s to 1980s because they say got Singapore maritime economic security, there are a lot of pirates then, which can be a threat to our trade, our sea trade. So, together with other countries in ASEAN, we actually contested the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia in 1978 as well. So this is important because there are things that goes beyond our borders, but they would affect Singapore. So we do have to make a stand and ensure that all these interests are taken care of. One case is the idea of Pedra Blanca. This is a very interesting case because if you look at the map, Pedra Blanca is actually situated way away from Singapore. It's way far from Tokong Island where the recruits actually go. So how is that piece of island, which is a small piece of land, still a piece of land, is actually heavily contested between two countries, between Malaysia and Singapore. And let's take a look. If you look closer, this is an aerial shot of the place itself. It takes notes of the entire place itself. You can see that it's like a rocky remains. There's not much room around. They are actually secured. There's a helipad, storeroom, kitchen, uh, visit tower. There's a middle rock, middle rock there. You have a generator room, water desalination plant, water storage, and a lighthouse. So generally, it's really small, but it is being fought over by two countries. It's an island. It sits between the eastern entrance of the Straits of Singapore. It lies about 24 nautical miles to the east of Singapore. Yes. So if you take a look here, we are looking at a distance between Pedra Blanca to Malaysia. We are talking about about 7.7 .7 nautical miles. We are to Pula Bintan, which is Indonesia, is 7.6 nautical miles and M. Okay, it's not nanometer, this thing not. But to Singapore, it's actually 24. So it's way further. So shouldn't it belong to either Indonesia or Malaysia? Dude, that is the interesting part. So its location has been strategic importance to us as it commands the entire eastern approach to the Straits of Singapore through a most of 900 ships pass by. So even though that it is further away from us, but this is the entrance, of, if you look at the middle channel there, is where the ships actually enter and go in the port of Singapore. If we lose that place to other countries, it means that we might actually lose the entrance when we have to pay tax, we, have, we might actually be blocked because it's no longer part of our land. So all this is of strategic importance. We must make sure that the ships will be able to enter into the port of Singapore. Uh, through our sea channel and if you look at the area if you own the piece of island and the middle rocks then the area around the island is also considered yours which is talking about the sea that is surrounding Pedra Blanca so the oldest feature is actually the Hosburgh Lighthouse is built by the British they built it during between 1847 and 1851 which is very very early and it, obviously the lighthouse is to prevent ships from crashing into the rocks. And the dispute actually arose in 1979, which is a 100 plus years later, when Malaysia published a map that claimed the island as hers. It is very interesting because when people publish maps, it's actually to claim territory. And if you do not contest it, you might actually lose areas, which is supposedly yours. So in response, Singapore, feel that it is not okay and we lodged a formal protest with Malaysia in 1980s. And both countries agreed to resolve their defense amicably through a friendly manner through a third party by bringing the territorial dispute to the International Court of Justice. So even though there is a conflict of interest in terms of territorial interest, we still decide that it is best resolved through amicable means, through a neutral third party. So the International Court of Justice, you can see that's the logo. And not only that, Singapore is also active in other areas such as international trade and law, civil aviation and maritime affairs, we are talking about pirates, uh, how they affect us, sustainable development, uh, water and sanitation, very important in Singapore. We have human rights, and last but not least, international climate change. This is also very important in Singapore. And all this, even though it might seem very far off, but they do affect Singapore 
in a various numbers of ways. So let's take a look at one example of case study of Little India Riot. Little India Riot, let's take a look at the timeline. So on the 8th of December 2013 at 9.20 p.m., Satifa Kumar Velu, a 33-year-old Indian construction worker, is run over by a private bus and he was killed. At that point of time, at 9.23 to 9.25, the police and the Singapore Civil Defence Force were notified of the incident. First, police and emergency vehicles arrived at the scene, and the crowd size actually increased to about 100 plus. Please do take note, this was run over in Little India, where a large number of Indian national work and Indian, they like to congregate there and relax after a hard day of work. So, at 9.41, police reinforced progressively arrived at the scene, and the crowd actually becomes more unruly because there were a large number of people drinking. Uh, this crowd actually become unruly, and the size actually increased. The SOC is activated. So, the police and the SCDF, Singapore Civil Defense Force personnel, attempt to extract the victim's body because he's still under the bus. They also cover the bus driver and his assistants as they move from the bus to the ambulance. And the mob is very aggressive and pelt them with various items because they were very angry that their fellow countrymen were run over by a bus driver. And I think it was an accident and it actually ran over him. And in this case, there are two troops of SOC forces arrive at the scene. And the police also activated a major recall of 53 patrol cars from police units because the crowd is getting very, very unruly this time. And they actually form up and begin to disperse the crowd and they start arresting riots. But then the riots was quite serious and a number of cars were all overturned. So the mobs actually dispersed at 11.45 from 9 all the way to 11.45. The mob finally dispersed and they conduct high visibility patrols in the area to prevent the rioters from regrouping. And this is quite important because they might regroup and start in a riot at a later time. So this is done throughout the entire evening uh, and two morning. From 1 to 5 a.m., police investigation actually conducted at the scene and national environmental agencies start cleaning up the area after investigation were done. So during this time, they were investigating what actually happened and started off this riot. The race course road reopens to traffic at 6.45 a.m the next day. So think about the various efforts actually needed to maintain internal security. Is it easy to actually do so? And what are the efforts to maintain external security? Because there is a need to maintain our sovereignty and there is a need to make sure that our interests are not compromised. So why are they important and how successful have these efforts been? I think this will be a very important question to ponder at this point of time. Uh, you can pause this and look through uh, your notes and see whether they can be of help. And how was the suggestion to improve the, the existing efforts? Because as um, life progresses, there are a lot of changes and threats may change from time to time. And we are talking about internal and external security, not just in terms of human threats. We are talking about other kinds of threats like the recent pandemic uh, coronavirus. So there are always suggestions to improve the existing effort to make sure that it's actually getting better and making sure that our interests are protected. So, next part. We are supposed to ensure justice. The role of a government is to ensure justice because the judiciary responsibility is to independently interpret and apply the law passed by the legislature where they come out with the law. The judiciary is supposed to judge and make sure that the law is passed fairly and equally to every citizen. So with the judiciary, the Singapore will be confident that they will be judged fairly regardless of what happened. So there are actually a number of courts such as Family Justice Court. They actually provide guidelines as to what is defined as a family violence which can apply to personal protective order in case of family domestic violence case. So personal protection order is one of the many services that is provided to ensure that victims are protected from their aggressors. If an applicant receives the PBO, the court can actually take actions to prevent or restrict a person from entering the applicant house to prevent the person from coming to close contact with the victim. An uh, example of how the justice is applied in Singapore is the murder of Huang Na. So Huang Na was an 8-year-old Chinese national. She lives at 
Pasir Panjang Wholesale Center in Singapore, and she disappeared on the 10th of October 2004. And this is a picture of her. And what happened is that her mother activated the police and informed the police and made a police report. And the whole community, the police and the mother, conducted a three-week-long nation search for one child. And if it's so long, it means that she was missing for that long. And when they finally found her, if you look at this scene, uh, there are a lot of crying family members and members of public which got the national attention because they found her body. And many Singaporeans actually attended her wake and funeral giving biting, which is actually contribution towards the funeral expenses and gift. And they were actually very outraged by the incident because this is actually a high profile case where they found the person she was uh, murdered. So what happened is that during the 14 days trial, this Malaysian born to like how the vegetable packer at the wholesale center, he was found guilty of murdering her. Yeah. And he was hanged after an appeal and uh, the request for presidential clemency actually failed. And she was hanged till he died. So laws are actually applied to ensure that justice prevails in uh, the society and whatever law that is being passed is being judged fairly and ensure that there's justice. So the next part will be to provide goods and services for the public. So government devote a significant resource to improving the well-being of their citizens. And the daily life citizens enjoy benefit from the goods and services provided and subsidized by the government. For example, if you are walking late at night, you see the lights above you, they are provided by the government through the taxes that you pay. And if you look at the traffic lights, they are built by the government to ensure that traffic flows and you do not get into a car accident as you cross the street. Well, you might, but it reduces significantly the chances of that happening. So what is a public good? A public good is a good or service that is provided without profit to all members of society, usually by the government. So if you're walking on the streets and the streets lights are switched on at night, regardless of who you are, you may be very rich or very poor, it's still switched on for you. So it's done without profit. So what are some of the goods and services that are provided by the government? So one is public housing, the other one is healthcare and water. Last but not least is education. Take a look at example at a public transportation. So this is the MRT route of Singapore. If you take a look, it is very, very outdated. This is the initial map that when MRT was first built, there's only two lines. It's not even linked to the Northeast Line. So this is the initial map. Over time, we decided to expand and work towards a more people-centered public transport system, which caters to people from all around Singapore. So if you take a look now, this is the current plan where you are served by both MRT, which is a mass rapid transport and LRT light rapid transport. If you take a look at the map, this is actually a lot of lines connected, interconnected to each other. And more lines are being added as we are speaking. So there are more connections and better service. So we also include competitors to the uh, SBS major, they are called the Tower Transit. They are actually introduced new buses. They are new USB charging ports if you are not uh, aware of them. And they are actually new driver fatigue and collision detection systems so that to ensure that they do not collide due to fatigue and make sure that accidents are minimized using a computerized system. And they are actually new seats. Besides that, we also came up with an app. It's called My Transport SG. What it does is that it allows people to know when the bus is coming and what bus to take to travel from one place to another. So it's actually a mobile application which indicates the bus arrival time. This is really very useful to make your transport from one place to another very, very smooth. There's also the Sengkang Transportation Hub, which is fully air-conditioned. It's a mix between Compass Point, we have a RRT and a Compass Hype. A living commercial and a transport hub all together in one place. Take a, another look at the water. Water is very important in Singapore. If without water, it might cause a crisis. So Singapore is very scarce in terms of 
water. So we have our four national taps which ensure us a sustainable and reliable water supply. We have local catchment area which is such as MacRitchie Reservoir. We actually we use the water which is under new water. We import water from Malaysia and last but not least we bring in water from the sea. We desalinate them and we ensure that they are drinkable water. So last but not least, we move on to how to safeguard the interests of citizens. As a government, it is their responsibility to make sure that the interests of the citizens are taken care of. So they will implement legislation, not the law, to safeguard interests. And this ensures that citizens will have a sense of security living in the country. The interests of citizens actually vary very widely as you have learned from other chapters and it can be safeguarded in various places such as ensuring that there is no abuse of employers such in terms of wage, in terms of the conditions and the sense of security in old age. So, Work Right Initiative is one example that the government has come up with to ensure that the lower income and lower wage earners are taken care of. This initiative is brought to make sure that the workers understand the rights and responsibility of the employers and their own employees as well. Employers and the employees. And they create awareness of employment rights among low-wage workers because some of them do not know their rights, such as their wage being unfairly docked. That is totally unfair. Better ensure retirement security for this group of workers as well. So do you know their employment rights? So it's a very important question that as you grow up and you understand more about the society, you need to know your rights. Your rights to be paid salary on time, your salary not to be unfairly docked. This is quite important. And let's take a look at, at one example of Central Provident Fund, which is CPF. So it actually helps Singaporeans prepare for retirement. And other users such as finance their housing, finance healthcare needs from Medisafe, and have a source of lifelong income in retirement. So when they retire, they can use the sum that they have saved up to ensure that they retire comfortably or at least have a decent standard of living. Why? Because we take a look from the past in the 1950s when Singapore first started, with the life expectancy, people are only expected to live until 60 years old, then they will pass away. But as Singapore become more affluent, we have access to better health care. In 2015, the average life expectancy is 82 Yes, so, and in the year two zero two zero, is eighty three point six six. That is very high. We are one of the top ten highest life expectancy in the world. So, if it's important for Singaporeans not just to be able to live that long and to have a decent standard of living as they grow older, and it's not just that we have a source of lifelong income in retirement, depending on how old you are. No matter how old you are, you are still able to have access to income so that you will not die of hunger. Which introduced CPF Life. So what CPF Life is to make sure that you have a sustainable income regardless of how old you live all the way until the day that you move on to a better place. So you can retire with a peace of mind and it was introduced in 2009 to write Singaporeans with a lifelong monthly payout in retirement. So this ensures that Regardless of how long you live, you have a monthly income to ensure that you can live, have a decent standard of living. This applies to all Singapore citizens or permanent resident, and they need to have savings in the CPF retirement account that they will be eligible for CPF life. So there's actually two plans. So there's a standard and the life basic plans. Uh, when you have high monthly payout but lower bequest, it means that you can actually get more payout per month but if they're excess, if you pass away, that means that they have actually a sum given to the beneficiaries, which is the people that you decide who will receive, should you pass away, is lower. But there's also life basic, which you get a lower monthly payout, but you get a bigger sum for those you need, such as your child and your other half. There's a choice between them. And it's still constantly changing because, well, the expenses might change and all these are up for negotiation because what a person need may change as Singapore becomes more expensive. So the level of payout actually depends on the amount of CPF you have and a plan they have chosen. 
This is one of the initiatives that come up because Singaporeans are living longer. They need to have a source of income and the current plan of one lump sum payout may not be enough. So this is why it's being switched to this CPF life plan. That's the end of chapter 3 part 1. I hope that you have learned something from it and please stay tuned to chapter 3 part 2. Thank you and have a nice day.